Hello, I'm Jordan, and I'd like to welcome you back to the Business, Innovation, and Technology podcast, a discussion with leaders inside and outside Facebook talking about current trends in technology and business. Today, we're joined by a very special guest, Matthew Sinclair, who is the partner and vice president of engineering at Boston Consulting Group Digital Ventures, and Facebook's very own Jean-Marie Ferdegui, one of our directors of engineering. So Matthew, can you tell us a little bit more about you and who you are and what it is you do at BCGDV? Sure thing. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Matt Sinclair and I'm partner and vice president of uh, engineering here in London for DV. Um, if I go back, I've been building software for more than 26 years now. Um, over that time, I've worked on everything from flight simulator in Singapore, um, haute couture fashion, e-commerce in Paris. Um, so I did a, a, quite a bit of work in financial services around high performance, mission critical payments uh, back in Australia. Um, I did a cement delivery system, uh, electric. I was lucky enough to be CTO of Coop, uh, which is an electric scooter sharing scheme down in Berlin in 2016. I've done pretty much everything else in between. Um, as I said, a lot of time in financial services back in back in Oz. Um, I've been involved in a few startups here and there, um, one or two that I started myself that were more or less complete disasters, uh, and some others that I was a, um, uh, an early stage employee of that, that went on to be to do a bit better. Um, I've done some management consulting, I had a small consulting business of my own, and about five years ago, I uh, moved over here, it's actually almost six years now, I uh, moved over to the UK with the family, I uh, started working at DV in that time. We've, I've been involved in one form or another in about 30 different ventures um, that we've put together in, in DV here in London. Um, uh, and DV itself in that time has built nearly 140, I think, uh, ventures all up. So, yeah, very happy to be here. Thanks, thanks for having me on. Awesome. And Jean-Marie, tell us a little about yourself. Sure. So I'm Jean-Marie Ferdeg. Uh, I'm Director of Solution Engineering in Gaming at Facebook. Um, prior to Facebook, I've had two main career tracks, one in consulting and one in product teams. Um, so I've been a director of engineering for now over 10 years um, alongside those two tracks, um, moving from very small businesses. I used to own my own, my own business and grew that, became the CTO of the company that acquired us, um, and also some consulting for small firms, either on the consulting side or on the management of the consulting practice side. Um, that's, that's me. Awesome. Well, very excited to have you both on the podcast today. And I'd love to jump straight in and go directly to Matt and ask, how do you see your job in relation to the intersection of business, innovation and technology? Um, okay, so, so at DV, we take what is essentially design thinking perspective when it comes to innovation. And, and if you're familiar with the pr principles of design thinking, it's very crudely um, the idea that when you're thinking about innovation, you think about three distinct but interrelated concepts, desirability, feasibility, and vi viability. Um, and at DV, uh, we have to think about those three concepts in terms of questions that we constantly ask ourselves as we're building a venture. And that is, does it matter, desirability? Will it work, feasibility? And can we win, viability? So. Engineering obviously plays a big part in the feasibility question, but it's not enough for an engineer just to shoot things down or say that something won't work. Um, you need to be aware of potential solutions that might require new physics um, or might require multiple miracles to get an idea of the ground. And, and there's another job that a creative engineer needs to do, and that's basically to ask what if. So, so essentially, in, engineers have this unique perspective where they might be familiar with technologies or combinations of technologies that are not obvious to business people or, or designers. And, and uh, because of that, uh, the job of a DV creative engineer is to make sure that they say things like, what if we combine this tech with this other piece of tech? Or have you heard about this new, how this new piece of tech can unlock this opportunity? So creative engineers complement the designer's instinct to understand user motivations and latent frictions and a business person's instinct uh, to understand market size and unit economics and those kinds of things by considering the opportunities that can be unlocked with uh, creative use of new technology. Um, in my experience, this is a pretty unique way to think about innovation, and and we think it's it's a novel extension of the way design thinking traditionally works. Because in addition to taking a user centric approach, um, uh, you know, considering frictions and that a user may face, we add into this mix a technology centric viewpoint. And so they're not at, they're not at the exclusion of each other or, or at odds with each other. They work together, um, and and so you know, engineering ends up sitting at the confluence of desirability and feasibility rather than sitting out on its own as an afterthought. That's, that's really interesting because, 
obviously at Facebook, I think about things slightly, slightly different thing, differently. Everyone within Facebook has a strong bias towards impact. Um, it's what we look for in candidates. It's what we train everyone on. It's the way we measure and reward performance. And while I'm sure it's probably different if you speak to research teams, that's also why we innovate in a way. Um, and that's something that really resonates with me. We don't innovate because it's our job or because we want to push new frontiers. We innovate because the mission we are on requires us to innovate. The problems we face don't have a ready-made answer and often you'd see a dialogue taking place between the problem and the innovation. And I, I really think personally that's, that's where the magic happens. Um, that's, that's what you were talking about, Matt, when you were saying about the confluence of desirability and feasibility. Innovation, from my experience, doesn't happen when we give engineers a problem to solve. It happens when we give engineers a problem to explore. It, that's, that's all grand, but in practice, what that means is that very often we'll explore a problem, we'll spend time understanding the scale of the problem in clear, measurable terms, and at that stage, we'll already have an idea of a solution that could solve it. We'll then explore the solution and often come back to refine our understanding of the problem and fine-tune the solution, always guided by the impact the work we're doing is likely to have. Sometimes the impact will take the form of a new product or the modification of an existing product, but it can also take the form of education pieces or more generally, whatever we have been able to think of to solve a given problem. So what I'm hearing from both of you is there's slight differences in team culture, but also some similarities as well. And, and I visualize a bicycle wheel with the right candidates or the engineers being at the middle. And there's the many dimensions that are, that are quite diametrically opposed. So we have the startup, but corporate. We have someone who's business focused, but engineering capable. And Matt, like, how have you gone about finding this diverse talent within your organization? But also, probably more interestingly, how do you measure your teams against fostering such a diverse and, and inclusive culture? Uh, okay, so this is really one of the most important questions that an engineering need, leader needs to uh, consider for, for a couple of reasons. So, and I, I'm sure this is the same at Facebook as it, as it is at DB. People drive our business more than anything else. Um, um, you can have as many great ideas as you like, but there's really no way to bring those, those ideas to fruition um, without some great engineers. And, and to be fair, you can't even do it just with great engineers. And I think this is one of the, the secret sources of DV is this idea of the multidisciplinary team. Um, and, and within those multidisciplinary teams that we put into ventures, engineering is just, just one part of it. And we've got this sort of internal term that I, it's PED for product engineering and design. We call it peddling, right? And it's this ped cycle that, that is super important to how, how our ventures work. Um, and then, and then to answer the second part of your question, when we hire people, we look for these two traits, um, and we we, I, we we we've coined a few of these sort of oxymoron type uh, phrases that we used when we're hunting for people, but because they 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 sort of call out the the inherent um, challenges we've got in finding exactly the right kind of people. So so from an engineering point of view, we look for deep generalists and aspirational entrepreneurs, and uh, and the phrase the deep generalist phrase, as I said, it's a bit of an oxymoron, but it's intentional. Um, and I, I, um, I kind of I'm riffing a little bit on on uh, Kent Beck wrote this fantastic paper called uh, fantastic post called Paint Trip People uh, and the Paint Trip uh, Metaphor and the idea and it's in contrast is T shaped uh, person that you you hear about all the time and I don't really like the T shaped um, view of the world because it seems rather static in time and and Kent Beck's Paint Trip People idea is imagine a paintbrush dipping it in paint and, and paint it along the wall and what you get is depending on how long you stay in a particular spot you get a deeper drip. And, and I, that's how I feel, uh, that's how I think about engineering an engineer's career over time. They dip into things over, you know, for some period of time and then they, they lift back up again and, and, and they, they go deep, but they, they've all, they're also, they also have this generalist uh, view. And that's really important for us at DV because we're doing such a wide variety of, wide variety of things. And so, and to answer the other part of your question, the other thing we look for is, is entrepreneurial spark or this aspirational entrepreneur. And what we do when we're talking to, to people is we say, um, I, I say to them, uh, we're looking for someone who has been, currently is, or aspires to be uh, a venture CTO, uh, sorry, a, a CTO. And then what they can do when they come to DV, they get to act in the role of CTOs on, on our ventures. And obviously not everyone is going to be a CTO. We have a career path from associate senior uh, up through it. But the idea is the thing we're looking for there is someone who wants to really get in and create something and build something for themselves. And folks who've been a founder or have been a CTO or have been in that in that career path, they have that entrepreneurial spark and that's fundamental to, uh, to, to, to the kind of people we want to hire. 
That's really interesting because I like I like what you just said partly because because I like what you said, but also because it's a, it's in many ways I think Facebook has a a unique, to my knowledge, way of of approaching how the teams work work together. So Facebook has this concept of XFN, which is cross cross functional. Um, which really talks to your point about bringing teams of various specialism working together. So, for example, we don't intentionally go out to hire people with a background in our direction within, within my group, right, within solution engineering. Um, but we find a lot of people with that skill set in other parts of the org. And from a culture perspective, everything and everyone is used to working together. Um, so that goes back to the point I was making earlier about impact. If most of what you care about is impact, it's clear that you are better off working with others rather than in silo for exactly the same, the same thing you were talking about before, about peddling, right? It's, you need all these different skill sets to work together. Um, and you're right, even with a, a team of engineers, we want people with different backgrounds, different experiences. That's something we're extremely careful about when building the teams. Um, then something we keep nurturing via psychological safety in the teams. And psychological safety is, a, is I find, a, a fairly fancy term um, for something which should be fairly, fairly basic. Um, it just talks to the fact that people within a team should feel comfortable bringing their best and worst ideas to the table, and that often the best and worst ideas are hard to distinguish at first. So we should give listening time to both, um, and from there see which one, which one are, are the good one, which one, which one are the bad one. I like the psychological safety angle. Um, and one of the ways we, we manifest that is with what I call failure fitness. It's a bit like gym fitness. You know, you go to the gym in the first couple of weeks, you're just completely destroyed and you can't move. But then after a couple of weeks, you, you, you're doing the same weights, but you're not as physically destroyed as you were. And it's because you've got gym fitness, right? You've sort of built up some muscle memory around the basic work. And, and I apply that to failure. And I think it's one of the most criti critical um, parts of, of uh, psychological safety. Do I feel safe to fail in front of front of my colleagues, right? And, and in particular, in front of my, my, my uh, managers or, or leaders, right? And, and I'm, I'm a big, I'm very transparent with failure. And I try and, you know, Celebrate it may be a bit of a pithy uh, phrase, but certainly encourage people to be as comfortable with failure as, as they as they can be. And then I do that, you know, by I, I I'm really honest and transparent with my own failures. Um, and hopefully that that's a, that's something that people can can um, model their own behaviors yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. So Jean Marie, I want to throw this one out to you, and that some people outside of our two companies or in the industry would refer to business or clients as being the opportunity and some would consider engineering as the cost of doing business in some sense so with that statement in mind like how do you go about prioritizing the opportunities based on the resources that you have i think my answer to that one is, would probably have been very different prior to my time at facebook um, but I think there's, there's two things, two principles we've got within Facebook that, that have really changed my, my approach. One is, and I keep referring back to that, one is the focus on impact. Um, the fact that between, between multiple priorities, you can just measure to the best of your ability. It won't be perfect. It will be inaccurate. But you can predict which one will have the most impact. Um, it might not be the easiest one, it might not be the hardest, um, it might be one that requires you to work on, on you and as a team, one that requires you to work in collaboration with others, but always be driven by what is going to have the most, the most impact. Um, and the other principle um, is the ruthless prioritization. So one thing I discovered that when I joined Facebook is that the teams are really lean, um, and they're not lean because I think because of lack of cash or because of uh, a lack of appetite to grow the business. They lean precisely because if you are if you have a team which is really lean, then you prioritize more ruthlessly. If you have the ability to just go, I need more resources, and then the ask is fulfilled, provided you've met your criteria, you will very quickly blow up the scope beyond beyond the one that has the most impact, the most value. So I think having this kind of forcing constraint of going, 
your team is really small and your scope is really big forces you to prioritize ruthlessly. Um, so that's that's how we go we go about things in in the team. Um, but I, I'd love to hear what our BCG DV approach approaches that. Well, uh, the first thing I'll say is I love the idea of manufactured constraints. Um, uh, they they like putting rails around things to sort of limit selection uh, um, and and um, uh, you know limit confusion is a really really great way to to do exactly what you said right which is to focus people's attention actually one of my interview questions often uh, which i stole from someone else but I, I use it shamelessly is i get them to talk about a system that they've worked on or they've, they've been comfortable with and you know to, to get them very comfortable in the conversation they say okay what would you do if you had a third of the time and a third of the people what would you have done right and it just sort of focuses the attention right think if you got a third of the resources that you thought you had what would you do and, it, and so I, I completely agree with that 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 idea that we we have very lean teams as well at dv but but just let me let me push back slightly on the premise of the question i don't i don't see engineering as a cost of doing business at dv the, the way we work because without engineers who can build software we just simply wouldn't be able to do what we do right um and but to be fair there on, on that point dv is a bit unusual compared to many other businesses um uh, uh who are building software whether that be enterprise or established businesses and that we're basically forming a new team for each venture and and so in some ways it's a bit more like the movie business than it is sort of enterprise software business in in that sense you know you get a bunch of people to come together with skill sets and you and and and, and fire them up to do a particular thing it's like a zero to one kind of thing as opposed to a longer term uh, maintenance or development kind of thing um, and then to the extent that we do prioritize the work the engineers work on, um, it, it comes uh, from being selective about what the ventures we build, sorry, what the ventures are we build with our clients. Um, we, we try to be really selective there so that we're sort of deploying our, our, our very scarce resources into the most impactful. I love that word as well. We use that everywhere in DV impact into the most impactful businesses we can. Um, and then to, to when we're running say an innovation or a validation sprint which is the stuff that we do sort of before we we might start building um and we end up with uh one or more pre-qualified ideas uh, about a standalone venture or product or service that we want to build and then in, in in collaboration with a client this is a point where we put the venture team together and so that that selection process is happening by virtue of which ventures we're, sele- we're, we're choosing to build right and so that's that's effectively our prioritization mechanism and then and then once you get into a fully fledged build an incubator which we call an incubation your your product manager is then acting as the as the prioritization point you know there that that's the person who's got the day-to-day cut and thrust of the venture and they're they're arbitrating between what the customer what the designers think the customer wants what the business people think will be the most profitable thing to build and what the engineers think is the most feasible thing that they can do and the pm sort of sits in the middle of that of that of that um process again in the pedaling they're effectively pedaling the pedals um as it were uh, in that process no, thanks, Matt, for, for pushing back on the question. Yeah, it's definitely a, a much more insightful answer. And with that in mind, though, I would like to change tact and offer you a, a different type of question. So we've covered team building and we've covered building culture. So I'd love to get you to share a bit about how you think about approaches to innovation around sort of ideas and executions within within DV. The, the basic premise behind DV is, is the idea that we take the hack and hustle of the startup world and we combine it with unique corporate assets of our partners. And then we try and build great ventures at a, at a velocity that's just simply unattainable to them working on their own, uh, using their own product and service uh, development processes that they, they, they may have. And for this to work, you have to have three things have to be true. You have to have a methodology that, that facilitates this process. And so that that's some repeatable behavior that you can deploy and you don't have to reinvent every time. You need very good people um, and who can work in multidisciplinary teams. And that's, that's not always how people think about certainly engineering. You often find in particular enterprise the engineers are over there and the designers are over there and they don't actually work together so that's that's fundamentally important and then i think this is actually the the main secret of the what dv does is, is this idea about unique corporate assets having that the when when if you were going to build a start if jean marie and i were going to build a startup in a garage we could have the best idea in the world and the be, access to the best algorithms in the world for, for doing some you know machine learning thing that we might think would be cool but what we would really struggle to get access is data to train some of those models on for example just to use a machine learning example but when you work with these the clients like we do they've got these vast corporate data sets that that we can we can deploy uh, mod, uh, training uh, um, uh, against and that gives us it just advantage that's just unavailable to to a, t- to a typical startup um, so those three things um, you know those three things come together and the, the last thing I'll say is um, 
We've also had about six and a half years now, maybe depending on where you count from, um, of refining and and uh, and uh, this this methodology, building, launching, and scaling more than 140 ventures. And so this is a huge deal flow, right? So what we what we're really quite good at is spotting signals for what does and doesn't work. And you hear people, you hear startups talk about pivots all the time. We've got a pretty pretty good sense now, particularly in our product management cohort, of of the sorts of signals that you need to look for that tell you that this may not be working properly, and then you can you can pivot, and we can do that quite quickly. And so those those pivots happen all the all the time, actually. Um, but you know, you, when, when you start building something, you start testing it, you start to get the feedback, and if it's not the right kind of uh, traction, you're not getting the right kind of traction quickly. You sort of you you you're actually in a pretty good position to go, okay, hang on, maybe we need to do something different. I really love I really love that. I really love one aspect of BCG DV which is the this kind of meta innovation, right? You've got the innovation that happens within each of the startups, but you also have innovation that happens about how you you identify these signals and how the same the same opportunity, the same startup if it was to come again, you probably would approach it differently because you've you effectively improved the recipes that that you use to unlock innovation. Um, and I think innovation these days is is shrouded in a in a combined veil of of mystery and admiration. You know, the, you've got that almost drives some misguided principle or of faith. Um, the, the example, for example, that all innovation can only happen in young, small tech startups with heaps of investment. Um, I think it's it's really tempting, right? It's it feels very romantic. It's this idea of the underdog backed by a wealthy believer that has nimbleness as its ultimate weapon. There's, there's something very Robin Hood about it, um, which we, we all craving for, right? The, that brings us back to our childhood where the, the small underdog will, will win the fight. Um, I think the reality is much more complex. Um, in my experience, the real trait of innovation isn't the size of the company, it's not the age of the company, it's in any environment I've seen, whether large or small, um, old or, or new, the trait of innovation is always the same. And that's something that we touched on before, it's psychological safety. Um, whatever the size, you need to have a group of people that can safely get their ideas heard, have their ideas debated and improved. That's crucial for coming up with the best ideas. Then you need to have everyone in that same group capable of raising their hand and admit that they need help or to do their job in a slightly different way that you had initially planned. And for the organization around them to adapt and still value that work rather than judge and just course correct to go back into, into what you had initially planned. Um, so I think it, it goes back to some, something which is, I think, deeply human and that's personally why one of the reasons why i love my job there's we all have this temptation to protect yourself and that's really something if you want to unlock innovation that's something that you need to learn to let go that you need to let people let the guard down um, and and instead serve the problem that you're after rather than protecting your idea or protecting the ideas of people that you think could be good alive. And, and I think that goes back to what you were saying before, Matt, about failure fitness, right? You need to, you need to let people or teams fail and, and still go, that's, that's all right. That doesn't matter. As long as we are still, we have learned something along the way, we are after a goal which is still valuable to go after, Failure is part is part of the process, and actually, there's a lot of learnings, really good learnings, that you wouldn't have been able to have if you hadn't failed. Um, so, one thing for me that really helped me um, is to always go back to the problem you're going after, and because I find that that's a really good way to build that psychological safety, to have a really good. That's once you know what problem you're going after as a team, as an organization then that's a really good catalyst for action to start with. Um, but that's also a really good way to build the culture. You know that this is the thing that you want to protect. You want to protect the problem you're going after. Um, you don't want to protect your personal ideas or your personal belief that you've taken from, from other jobs. Um, and that's, that's a really good way to keep that momentum. Um, so coming back, John, I'm sorry, going back to your question of my approach to innovation, um, I'd start by describing the problem we see, not the solution, 
and defining one or two metrics that we expect to see moving if we if we tackle that problem. If I could just just come back, uh, Jean Marie, on, on one point and actually just sort of maybe address the original question as well in a slightly different way. I'm in in my role, or DV's role is essentially corporate innovation uh, as opposed to you know the classic sort of uh, valley funded um, uh, valley VC funded startup type type culture. And we've seen something really interesting happen in, and I, it's hard to sort of put a marker on when this shift happened but it's definitely a shift that's happened and you can sort of look back and, and see the change if you go back five years ago when i first started at dv there was genuine concern from corporates that startups in every industry sector that you went to were going to come along and eat their lunch and they're really worried and so they wanted to do the, the idea of corporate innovation back then was how do i do a corporate how do i do corporate vc or how do i do a, a startup mm. inside my, my corporate and what's really interesting is if you look at what's happened over the last say five years actually startups didn't really go and take corporates lunch what happened was the big nine and you know facebook i'll put facebook in the big nine right like the, the big six american uh tech companies and the big three three chinese companies um what's happened is they've they've really just accelerated away from everyone with with you know their their, their tech platforms and so now what it, when it, what when smart corporates look um are looking at threats they're actually less worried about startups and they're worried about two things one is is the big nine is one of the big nine going to move into my industry in some way right and 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 do the job better and faster and and, and with a much better user experience because all the big nine have fantastic user experiences and many corporates have terrible user experiences or is it my own incompetence that is going to hold me back relative to other players in my in my in my vertical, right? And so, so that's really interesting. That changes a little bit what your innovation um, uh, orientation is, and from a corporate point of view, now you're less worried about what I call outside the firewall innovation. So building startups that are standalone business, and you're much more interested in inside the firewall innovation, which is how can I deploy deep technologies, or how can I use that some of those techniques and processes that come from the startup world how can i use them on my core business okay and that's a really interesting shift that we've seen in the last couple of years so you've both touched upon metrics or a way of measuring what's going on to have impact and most innovative projects or, or programs that happen you know the, the folks within them will obsess over the notion of, of product market fit and, and as a proxy you know a lot of them will use metrics you know, volume of users engagement you know, etc things like that to really have a, a sense of what's going on. But as we've discussed and highlighted, you know, success can take many forms from a standard startup being exited to integrating within a corporation, you know, a successful venture to scaling and having mass adoption of a product that has been built within you know, a company like Facebook. So how do you drive towards those goals, Matt, at times when at some points, you know, they could be, orthogonal to one another or, or pulling in different directions um yeah look this is a really good question we, we we talk about product market fit at dv all the time um actually and i i throw in uh profitable product market fit because pro product market fit is one thing but when you're trying to scale a business you actually have to find there's got to be you've got to build an engine that can profitably deliver product market fit and they're not quite the same thing um but, but we, so we certainly obsess over it and and the way i would frame this up is that our, our venture teams um, are what i call product led and and by that i mean that during an incubation like during a build when we're actually writing software the ventures product manager is the person who's basically directing traffic and get, you know, get um, about what gets done moment to moment. The job of the PM is to firstly understand what product market fit means in each particular case. Um, and it can really vary wide, widely. As you can imagine, we're doing all sorts of stuff. On one day, I might be in industrial goods, the next day, energy, the next day, climate. And so product, and, and again, you can be inside the firewall or outside the firewall and product market fit there means very different things product, market, and fit are all very context specific to the, to the venture we're building. Um, and look, and so uh, if, if, we're, if we're building something entirely inside the corporate partners firewall, um, you know, as I said, in that case, the definitions of product, market, and fit might be very different. Product might be an existing product. The market might be internal customers, you know, might be business users. And then fit might be, um, uh, it could be uh, something talking about efficiency improvements, or it could be you know, it, it could be a, a cost saving, okay, as opposed to what you typically see as external measures, things like traction, okay, and uh, and, and maybe NPS scores and that kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I think the simple answer to the question, just to, to summarize that, is that it depends um, and it's really context specific or venture specific in our case. And in fact, one of the one of the tricky jobs of the PM at DV is to work out what product market and fit might mean in that in that venture and then set up, go looking for the signals that will reinforce that, that product market fit has been acquired. It's interesting because 
I think you're right, right, Jordan? In, in your question, you talk about how companies obsess over the metrics. Um, and I think you're right. Companies obsess over the metrics that they see reflecting the product market fit, whether it's quarterly revenue, volume of users or, or others. Um, the risk is that if you use those metrics as a strategy to an exit, things will get very toxic very fast. Um, and before we're talking about problem statements being the combination of a description, and then you've got the metrics that are the proxy, the measurable proxy of the description. And I think there's something similar here. Um, it's crucial to always remember that the goal is the description itself, the metrics are really just a mere proxy of, of the goal. Um, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't think of the strategy as how do you use what those metrics have delivered the best. You, from my experience, when you're in a startup and you consider the exits ahead of you and how you optimize for them, the conversation is how the company vision aligns with an exit or another. It's not how your volume of users prepare you better for exit A or for exit B. It's whether the vision that you've had, which of course drove those volume of users in the first place, will better prepare you for A and, and B. And that's, that's also the conversation you will have as part of the exit itself of, of what is the value that we add, the, the mission that we want to, that this group of humans that have come together to build this product, to build this company, how does that, how does that align with what you as a company acquiring us, you're trying to do? Um, it's not so much about, or in my case, in, in the cases I've seen, it's not so much about how the, the volume of users will add and that kind of thing, that, that comes after. Um, so I think product market fit is not in itself about achieving one metric or another, it's about how much your market cared about the vision you put out there. Um, and that's really what, what will dictate the vision and the value of the company. Um, and very, very often, I think people get confused as to why some, some startups manage to raise insane amount of money for something which is not profitable. Um, that's because that's, that's I think, the, the crux of the answer is that they are on a mission. Um, they've managed to convince the investors that they are on a mission that people, the market will care enough to give them, to give them the time to do that. And therefore it's worth, it's worth investing. I, I think it's a really good point. I think if you if you think product market fit is some sort of algorithm that you can bunch some numbers into and you get a yes or no, I think you're in you're in strife. And I think what uh, you, you made a good point there. I call them vanity vanity metrics, Jean Marie. Like these idea, people chase these vanity metrics because they're simple to measure and they can show a you know a graph that's got a lot of upward movement on it. But in actual fact, it might not be measuring anything that's of any relevance whatsoever to to actually achieving product market fit or making customers happy. I think in my, my mind, product market fit happens after you've You've, you've done a bunch of really good work. You've found some frictions that people care about. You've built something that you can deliver to them that solves that problem, addresses, addresses those frictions in a, in a way that's profitable, where there's, you know, there's value that can be exchanged across the value chain, fr uh, value chain front to back where everyone benefits. Then you can look at it and you go, ah, oh, we've actually built this engine room. Now I can say we've got product market fit, right? It's not the other way around. Yeah, so I think it's, it's really interesting. In my mind, that almost connects to to a few things when I, I don't know if you've done that Matt, in one of your previous lives, but when you do some due diligence for startups, there's, there's that kind of activity that takes place of first understanding why are we doing, why are we brought in to do due diligence in the first place? What is of interest? Then you go and do the due diligence of finding the data, but you look for the data that backs up the story. And then when you do that, you start finding a lot more, a lot more data, some that prove, some that disprove, and then you come back and make make an opinion on, well, actually they're on a mission which is which is valuable, or there's there's something that doesn't quite align and that needs that needs further digging. I think it also connects almost to you know the Simon Sinek why or what. Like you start with the why. You, you don't start with the how and what were the measures. You're always starting with the why are they in business in the first place. And then the rest just follows. Um, so a good, a, a good volume of, of users or revenue or whatever in itself doesn't, doesn't justify driving for an exit or helping with an exit. It, it's, 
it helps making the rationale of the why stick or not stick. So thank you both for such an insightful discussion today. Like that is all we have time for. And I want to thank everybody for listening to the episode. Please do subscribe on your favorite podcast player, you know, share it within your teams, your network, your peers. And if you're feeling generous, you know, please leave a review as well. I'd like to thank our guests, Matt and Jean-Marie, and I'd like to leave you both to share some closing words with everyone. Look, I'll be very quick. Thank you very much for the opportunity to chat. It's been great. Um, uh, it's been planned for a while. I've really enjoyed it. Um, if you want to connect with me, uh, the best place is either Medium or Twitter. Um, uh, it's just visit matthewsinclair.com or one word um, or at Matthew Sinclair. Or you can go old school and send an email to hello at matthewsinclair.com. I'll be sure to reply. And uh, yeah, I was also really happy. To, it was a, a really good, really insightful conversation. It's amazing how much we, we learn as much as, as we share. Um, on this podcast um, so thanks a lot for the opportunity so thanks again for listening everybody and look out for the next episode <laughs>